Hello, everybody. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, just a quick note, this is a hybrid program, so um, if you're in the library, again, thank you for coming out. Um, we do have an audience joining from home on live stream, so um, at the end, uh, when we get to the Q&A uh, questions, if you have a question, just raise your hand, and I'll bring the mic over to you. That way, uh, people viewing at home will uh, be able to hear what was asked in the room. And then if you are joining online, uh, feel free to type any questions into the chat um, throughout the um, discussion tonight, and we will try to get them asked at the end. Um, before we get started, I just want to highlight a few upcoming programs we have um, coming at the library. Uh, this Sunday at 3 o'clock, uh, that's February 11th, we have the Now Festival kickoff. Um, we have Christopher Purdy in conversation with Ala Zagakech, um, who is a Ukrainian uh, composer and music producer, so that will be at the library, um, also on live stream this Sunday at 3. Uh, we also had the Toni Morrison Day celebration with poets Vernel Bristow, Stevie Knighton, Donna Marbury, and Scott Woods. Uh, that will be here on Sunday, February 18th, beginning at 1.30. Uh, the poets will be reading some of their favorite passages from Toni Morrison and then uh, reflecting on her legacy and her influence on their work. Um, the following night, Monday, February 19th, we have a book discussion for Toni Morrison's Pulitzer Prize winning classic, Beloved, um, and that will be with Simone Drake and Naomi Brenner from uh, The Ohio State University. And that is part of the Yiddish Book Center's Stories of Exile reading group that we are wrapping up this spring. Uh, lastly, I wanna mention we have uh, Throwback Thursday. Um, this is a uh, program that reflects on some unique history here in Bexley, and that will actually be at the Drexel Theater on Thursday, February 29th at 7 o'clock, so we'll be discussing uh, the history of the Drexel and taking a little uh, preview tour. Um, so uh, we are very lucky to be joined uh, tonight by uh, by Patty Flynn, but we also have a distinguished moderator, Sarah Grace. So I'm going to talk a little bit about both of them. Uh, Sarah Grace Heller is the chair of the Department of French and Italian and associate professor of French, French at The Ohio State University. She specializes in medieval French and Occitan literature, language, and material culture. Her publications include Fashion in Medieval France, A Cultural History of Fashion in the uh, Medieval Age, and articles related to sumptuary law, crusade literature, the Roman de la Rose, and the semiotics of culture. Um, she was also previously the director of associate uh, and associate director of OSU's Culture Center for Medieval and Renaissance Studies. And now for our featured speaker tonight, uh, we have Patty Flynn, who is the author of four novels, four novellas, and one picture book. Patty won the Romance Writers Inc. Award for Romantic Comedy, and her work has been nominated for numerous awards, including the Phyllis Wheatley Award for Fiction. Her latest series, The Last Favorites Page, is inspired by French historical figure Louis Benoit Zamour. It explores what life might have been like for this black man who was forever known as a traitor after turning over Madame Jeanne Duberry to the French Revolutionary Tribunal. Uh, the first book in the series, The Greatest Thing, was published in uh, 2023 and is available now. Uh, Patty has some books uh, for sale at the end, so if you don't have a copy yet, you can buy a copy tonight. Uh, we also have a QR code in the back if you want to uh, scan that and buy later. And uh, I was across the street at our local bookseller, Gramercy Books, and saw that they had it as well. So uh, please pick up a copy after tonight's discussion. I will turn it over to Sarah Grace and Patty. Thank you all for coming. I'm so delighted that you are here. It's really exciting to see um, so many people. And uh, I think, Patty, you want to start it off? Absolutely. Let's see if I'm trying not to cover my mic. <laughs> um, thank you all for coming. This is so exciting. Um, I love to talk about my book. And this is great to have all of you captured here. So you can't go anywhere. You can hear me talk about my book. <laughs> So thank you for coming out tonight. Um, I thought maybe I'd give a little information about how this book came about and why I started working on it. And then um, any questions as we go along, that's fine as well. So um, I started this book. Um, the idea came a couple years back. I um, was always interested in France and French 
a little bit of French history. I knew about the good French history. I didn't know about the other French history. Um, so um, I always wanted to visit France. And a coworker of mine asked me a couple years back why I'd never gone. And I told him, you know, I had all the excuses, time, money, you know, people to go with and all that kind of stuff. And then I decided I'm just going to go ahead and do it myself. Um, and then, of course, you know, pandemic happened. Put the kibosh on that. I decided I wanted some art for my condo. I'm sorry, this is a convoluted story. I wanted some art for my condo. And um, I was thinking about getting something that looks sort of 18th century French. And, um, and I did a search on Pinterest, and I came across a photo of a portrait of this man, Louis Benoit Zamor. Um, and the caption said that he had lived in uh, the Palace of Versailles, and he had lived during the time of Louis XV and Louis XVI. I was flabbergasted because I never knew there was a black man who lived at the Palace of Versailles. I never knew that part of history. Um, read a little bit more, and I found out that he is also the person who helped send Madame du Barry to the uh, Revolutionary Tribunal. And I thought, oh, it sounds like maybe there's a story here. <laughs> um, I still didn't know much about that time in history. And I don't know um, if you're aware about the whole situation with uh, the kings of France, um, the fact that they took mistresses, and that was a, a normal part of being a king, because marriages were for were deals and for brokeraging power and, and alliances. for alliances, peace alliances. But uh, mistresses were a pretty lofty position. They were very well respected. They were normally um, noble women, and um, it was a very, it, it was a title that many women wanted. Many noble they women They were almost wanted. like part of, you know, they were political advisors uh -huh. in many cases. These are not just sex objects. Mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. And so uh, Louis XV was notable because he actually found two mistresses who were uh, not noble women. The first was Madame de Pompadour, she raised quite a stink because she was always telling him what to do, politically speaking. She had very um, good taste. Did she? Oh, I didn't yes. know that. <laughs> she was known for her kind of subtle taste in dressing and decor. Yeah, the, uh, the whole Rococo movement um, with Madame de Pompadour, and she had really great shoes, little tiny feet <laughs> here in her portrait somewhere. I did not know that. Oh yeah. <laughs> so. After Madame de Pompadour died, actually, while she was alive, she stopped wanting to have relations with him, I understand. She was kind of sick all the time. Mm -hmm. And so she found, was she the one who established the group of women to serve him, service him? Yes. <laughs> the tradition of mistresses at court goes well back. I mean, uh, Francis I was a very athletic king in the Renaissance, and... He liked everyone in the court to be kind of young and uh, athletic and, and sexy. There was a lot of sex at that court. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. <laughs> I see. Um, and and Louis Louis the Fourteenth, the Sun King, all, you know, the, was also his mistresses had very important political positions. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's it's really established during those years of that absolute monarchy that the mistress became a political position mm -hmm. more than just a Fun job. Mm -hmm. So when Madame um, Du Barry, when he met her, it was an even bigger stink because not only was she not a noble woman, she was not a bourgeois woman, which is what uh, Madame de Pompadour was. She was a commoner and she was an escort. And um, you could be a noble escort, that was fine, but to be a common escort, that was a whole different thing. So. Uh, <laughs> All of the noble women at court uh, really hated uh, Madame Jean de Berry, hated her with a passion. Um, but so, so shortly after, he um, managed to find a way to make her his maitress in Pitre. I know that's, you can say it better than I can because my French is atrocious. Maitress en titre? Maitress en titre. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, he had to jump through some hoops to get her the official title because. She wasn't a noble woman. He had to arrange for her to get married. Um, she married uh, the brother of her, I'm going to call him what he is because I don't know the word in 
in French, uh, her pimp. <laughs> so she married his brother, and his name is Dubarry, and that's how she got that name. Um, the marriage allowed her to become a noble, so they satisfied that uh, requirement. Um, and they had to have someone introduce her officially to him at court. So he had to pay someone else to do that, to come to court with her and introduce her as if she was a noble person. So uh, managed to get through all that, and she became his official mistress. But as I said, she was hated by everyone at court. And then he arranged the marriage of his grandson with Marie Antoinette, who came along, who liked Madame du Barry until she discovered that she was a mistress and former escort, and then um, hated her. And they turned on each other, and they hated each other for most of their life after that. Um, theirs was a well-known rivalry. Um, I, I don't know what was at the root of it. It's kind of political it, generations, mm -hmm. too, I mm -hmm. think, in a conflict. Even got to the point where the king had to threaten Marie Antoinette that she'd better speak to Madame du Barry, or, you know, <laughs> or it would get ugly. So this was the environment um, into which uh, Louis Zemmour was brought into. He was uh, bought by King Louis XV or given to him. Um, no one really knows if Louis XV purchased him directly or if he was given as a gift, but he was an enslaved child. Um, who had been taken from India um, and brought all the way to France, taught French, and handed over to the king uh, of, of France who wanted to give him to Madame du Barry as a gift. And that's what happened. Um, there are very few documented facts about Zamor. We know that he was probably born around 18, or excuse me, around 1762. Uh, we know that he was in uh, a famous portrait of the opening of the pavilion at um, the Chateau de Louveciennes. Um, we know that he was baptized. Um, we know that after Madame du Barry was exiled, King, uh, King Louis XV died in 1774. And then uh, Louis XVI and Queen Marie Antoinette exiled Madame du Barry sent her off, but uh, Louis Zamor stayed there at the Palace of Versailles until uh, about two years after that time when she moved back with him to the Chateau de Lucien. Um, we also know that when he grew up, um, in so, around 1789, he made his way to Paris. He um, met with Jacobin leaders. The Jacobin Club is the club where the revolution was started, where um, the, the enlightened thinkers and intellectuals were discussing how to improve the country. And um, he made his way to Paris and became a Jacobin. He also made his way onto the Committee of Public Safety. That's pretty radical. Mm -hmm. Pretty. That, um, you depict him as an angry guy. And you know, becoming a Jacobin fits that category. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, the Jacobin Club was um, full of the most well-known revolutionaries: uh, Danton and Robespierre, of Robespierre. course, yeah. uh, Lafayette, uh, Brissot, and many, many others. Um, and he managed to to meet these people and get on that committee, which I thought was an amazing thing. Uh, we know that he turned her over, I'm, I, I don't mean to laugh, I, I just, um, we know that he turned on her, and we know that she was sent to the guillotine. And after that, he was actually arrested as well, and uh, as her accomplice, but he was released later. He disappeared from France for a time, and turned back up around 1815, lived in Paris for about five years, and then he died. Um, and so those are the things that everyone knows for sure. <laughs> yeah. There's a whole lot about him that people don't know for sure. Like so, so many historical, I mean, we know more about him than I know a lot of people. <laughs> you know, I, I, I feel like when I was reading about him, I um, was comparing him to people like Danton and Robespierre and Du Barry and all of the people that he was surrounded by. Um, 
he wasn't among you know the lesser known people. He he was in the center center of all this action. So it still surprised me that there was so little known about him as a person. Um, when I was reading about him, I, I read a lot of surface um, descriptions of him, and it did strike me that if he was anyone else, maybe someone else with a different skin color, they might have looked at him a little differently, they might have taken him more seriously, they might have researched his story a little bit more. So. Um, what I found was a lot of people had wonderful things to say about Madame du Barry. A lot of people loved her. They said she was sweet, she was the most beautiful woman, she was charitable, she was giving, she was kind, she was selfless, um, and he was horrible. So, oh. <laughs> and um, and I, I thought that was kind of strange, but I found this book that is, was pretty well known, I think. Um, and just to give you an, uh, a little, Guidance this is, this as far as biography. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a biography about Madame Du Barry, written by Joan Haslip. It's called Madame Du Barry, and I just wanted to read you a little bit of a portion of what she says, um, because um, this is I'm going to read you a portion of what she says for after. Um, Madam returned from exile. Okay, it says, Jean stayed on at St. Fran throughout the long winter of 1775 to six, the coldest and living memory, in which she opened her kitchens to the poor and needy of the neighborhood, while her spoilt, undisciplined servants quarreled among themselves. The most troublesome of all was the Indian Zamor, who had grown from an amusing little black amour Offensive language, by the way. <laughs> There's a lot of that in, in uh, old literature. Um, whose playful antics had amused the old king into an ugly, misshapen 16-year-old, hated by the other servants, insolent towards the steward, whom he was forever reminding that he was still in possession of the document signed by both the late king and the Lord Chancellor, which appointed him governor of Louveciennes. Both her steward and her lawyers were forever telling the countess that it would be wiser to dismiss some more, even if it meant adding to the pension he already received. But she had not the heart to throw the poor friendless boy out into the world. Some more stayed on, lonely, embittered, and as much out of place in the frozen countryside as Madame's pet parrot, who, whenever his mistress came into the room, had been taught to screech, there goes the lovely lady. <laughs> but at least the parrot, with its gleaming black feathers, was exotically beautiful, whereas Zamor had become so repulsively ugly that the countess could not bear to have him in the room. Mm. So this is just a little bit of what I, I found they were saying about him. And it was offensive to me because I thought, um, <laughs> for more than one reason, I thought, you know, she, um, she's obviously biased because she loves Dewberry so much. Um, so I was doing some research, and one of the things that everyone asked, even the people who didn't express open hostility towards Zamor, they all said, why did, she, why did he turn on her? Why? Why? She treated him so well. She dressed him in fine clothes. She, she put jewels on him. She, he was her oh. closest confidant. Right. I mean, if somebody gives you clothes, how can you betray <laughs> them, right? Exactly. And they all had this question. They just didn't understand why he could do such a thing. Because nobody had ever really seen him as anything more yeah. than her page or her servant. Mm -hmm. And that bothered me a little bit because oh, yeah. um, I think it's indicative of the way uh, people of color and people of marginalized communities have always been looked at as um, not a full human being with emotions and motivations and, and hopes and dreams. He was just seen as this terrible person because of what he did. Um, and so I, I thought, I'm going to look at this from his point of view, um, I as get opposed to rid of the royalist bias. Yes. It's clearly there. Yes. Did you track down her sources? I, you know, I didn't track down her sources. I tracked down different sources. Yeah. <laughs> it really sounds like she's editorializing yeah. based on what you say about the limited yeah. information we have about him. So. Yeah, I feel like at least 
with me, I'm writing fiction, and I tell you that I am, yeah. but this is supposed to be a biography. So, um, right. uh, so yeah. yeah. But, uh, genre matters, <laughs> yeah. Yes, it does. Um, so I, I thought to look at it from his point of view, and the question that I couldn't get out of my head was, I know he came to the Palace of Versailles as a slave, but I never read anywhere that he was ever freed. And I kept reading, kept searching, kept reading. Oh, there was no slavery in France at that time. I, there's, there's. So technically, that's 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 something that that um, you know historically was true that mm -hmm. slavery had been outlawed in France even though yes. there was engagement with the slave trade, the triangular slave trade between cities like Nantes and Bordeaux, mm -hmm. and the the Atlantic, the um, the Caribbean, and West Africa places like like Dakar and, and Senegal. So, mm -hmm. so just a little bit of. Uh, background there that you do a nice job of showing in the book, I think. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I, I, I just, I couldn't understand how that could be when France had so many slaves in the West Indies and the United States. <laughs> um, but um, I finally came across an article where somebody suggested the same thing that I did. They said that um, they understood that Zomor might have traded his freedom for Jean de Berry because they wanted her. I mean, the Revolutionary Tribunal, they really wanted her as a symbol of the ancient regime. They wanted to, um, they were going after her whether he was there or not. But he, um, I think from his point of view, um, he was in a precarious position. Here we have a man who is black, who is not free, who has not been given his freedom since he came to live with Madame du Barry, and here is an opportunity for him to get his freedom. And maybe he wasn't so conflicted based on the fact that he, she didn't give it to him in the first place. <laughs> so to my way of thinking, um, he must have, uh, he might have hated Madame du Barry. He probably did. That's, that's what you, that's how you <laughs> imagine it in the book is all yeah. the ways that he hates the court mm -hmm. but internalizes that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's really the trajectory that I think you take in imagining him. I think that there were people who weren't free as we'd imagine it, that that was pretty common at the court. Like, you, you were so obliged to certain people who had given you a position um, that, that, you know, there was, this is an era of in, indentured servants, too. And we, we see that a fair amount in the history of America, that there, there's a spectrum of freedom. I, I think it's, it's worth pointing out. Yeah. yeah, there is, there is. I think another thing that you show that's interesting when we, you know, you show that he's actually from India, but he's treated as a negre, right? Mm -hmm. um, to use, the, you know, a word that was common there. Um, and so slavery isn't just West Africa and the world, that, that it was much more complex and much more international than that. Yes, it was, and um, of course it changed with the transatlantic slave trade when it became um, dependent on skin color. And I did not realize how much uh, Louis the Fourteenth and the Fifteenth had to do with that. Mm. Um, but there was, of course, we all know that slavery has been around since the beginning of time, but there came a point when it changed into something that was different. It became something that you couldn't escape from um, because it was, uh, dependent on your skin color. And so... Um, it was a good fundraiser for the kings and for the... Yeah, yeah. For the bourgeois culture, so unfortunately. Yeah. Well, sl France was, was bankrupt, mm -hmm. and they were riding off of slavery money and, uh, and handing money over to the United States to, beat, uh, to win the war against uh, England, yeah. and that was slave money. So... Um, yeah, so slavery was, was becoming huge, even huger because in the United States, we you know, got the idea to just make more slaves. That's what we decided to do. Um, and so at the time, they had to, of course, justify this, this uh, inhumane treatment of people. And they started the, I, I, I think of it as a, um, a PR campaign is what it was, a worldwide PR campaign to say that black people were not people so that they could justify what they were doing. And this spread, um, the, the more money they earned 
off of our backs, the more this sentiment more spread. And, and that was felt in how they behaved towards people, even in like mainland France, where, um, you know, centuries before that, you know, Africans had no problems with France. They were trading back and forth. They had friendly relations. And then all of a sudden, the transatlantic slave trade came along. And all of a sudden, black people were no longer human. And so the black people on the mainland started to feel it as well. The free black people started to feel it as well, because um, the very definition of humanity was changing right in front of their eyes. So, um, so he was in a precarious position. Yeah, and, very isolated. Um, isolated, yes. And what hope did he have for his own future if he didn't have at least have freedom over himself? So when I thought about making, <laughs> leaning into how he might have felt about her, then I really kind of leaned in on uh, her becoming a little bit more of a villain than I originally planned to make her. <laughs> right, like, you, you know, you, you, you get your own bias as uh -huh. you take the bones that you can find in history and mm -hmm. imagine the world around them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I guess we can all think of people that some people love and some people hate. So mm -hmm. fair enough, mm -hmm. right? Different points of view. Mm -hmm. And, you know, no one's all good and all bad. Um, but I think the fact that they were making her all good and him all bad just stuck in my yeah, crow. Yeah, let's turn those tables. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, um, years later, um, what was interesting about what they did with him as a person, I thought, um, after, even after his death, is that they took his very name and turned it into something else. So um, they started calling young black male servants the Moors. They started referring to young black men, male servants who they felt were devious or deceitful or or disloyal or might be betray, you know, might betray them, they started referring to them as the Moor. The Moor became a term instead of his name, which I thought was fascinating. So let's back up mm -hmm. that um, <coughs> Madame du Barry gives him that name because she was a fan of Voltaire's fiction. Um, if, right, you put yeah. that in the book, you wanna talk about that yeah. a little bit? Um, so Madame du Barry was a close friend of Voltaire and he wrote a play about, um, oh gosh, I can't remember what the name of the play was, but he wrote a play about uh, a slave named Zamor. And, um, and the slave was a good Christian and, and um, it was his way of proving that maybe we shouldn't be doing slavery. Um, so she wanted to name Zamor. Uh, she named her new young uh, page after this character in Voltaire's novel, I believe. That's a little um, bit utopian, right? He's mm -hmm. you know, imposing good religion, uh -huh. and that, that rhetoric. But um, so Zamor starts out as kind of an idealistic name and then runs this course into something much more negative through this character. Absolutely. And then, of course, um, we believe she named him uh, Louis Benoit, the Louis after King Louis the Fifteenth. Uh, they baptized him, and uh, technically, he kind of became like their godchild. <laughs> yeah. Well, and Louis so. Benoit, Benoit is the French form of Benedict, right? So, blessed by Louis and blessed by God, right? So that's a terrific name. <laughs> yeah. I might try that on your own. But just like substitute, like Patty Benoit. Uh huh. That doesn't really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't have the same. Yeah, well, it don't go that direction. <laughs> so yeah, names are very telling that way. Yeah. Um, you also make him responsible for the king's death by smallpox, Louis the Fifteenth. Now that's a piece of fiction, but it was kind of fun and evil. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that's one of the things that runs through the book is um, this, this young Zamor trying to find ways to kill the king. <laughs> um, and, and so that's delightful. I think that you use it. Uh, I, would, I would note kind of three images that come back in, again and again. Can I talk about those a little bit? Sure, yeah. Shall we? Okay. 
So who's been to Versailles? Yeah, a bunch of people. Okay. And um, did you go into the gardens? It's kind of more fun than the house because there's more space out there, right? And the house is, the, the castle is very stuffy. It's full of tourists now, but it would have been mm -hmm. full of courtiers and servants at the time. Mm -hmm. You do a really nice job talking about the chamber pot and what a problem <laughs> they were. Because if you've been a tourist there, there weren't bathrooms at Versailles, right? It's all chamber pots, no bathrooms at all. Um, and, you know, so these powdered, perfumed people are combating, right, they're in these silks that take a month to weave a meter of these, of these silks in, in Lyon and other silk towns. Um, yeah, those big skirts <laughs> were ideal for accommodating what you need to do if, I'll, if you have to use a chamber <laughs> pot. You can use a chamber pot for revenge, uh -huh. but I'm on a tangent. <laughs> The gardens at Versailles were so nice because there's, there's room for the, the soldiers to go, right, go pee in the bushes. But, um, but yeah, there's a kind of relief in those gardens. Mm -hmm. You also create a scene of kind of a, a garden close by um, the, the castle where there are roses, right? The mm -hmm. symbol, we had the famous portraits of Marie Antoinette holding a rose. Um, but there also is a strange kind of berry and flower that mm -hmm. Zamor is curious about as a little boy. And he, the gardener says, don't touch that. Right? So there's poison in the garden, too. Mm -hmm. Belladonna, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and he dreams, he, he gets caught in the labyrinth when he's trying to run away, right? He gets caught, yeah. Um, he gets lost, I he, should say. Yeah, he gets lost. He's, he's wandering. He should be back at the palace. He's upset. And so he wanders into the labyrinth, that he's always loved the labyrinth because he's the only one who really knows how to get in and out. But he gets lost because he's so distraught. Mm -hmm. And he gets stuck. So this is a powerful symbol, mm -hmm. right? Who's been through a labyrinth? We've got one just up the street. It's St. Albans. So um, like historically, in, in pilgrimage churches, this was a pattern that you followed on the floor. and people. Pilgrims would often do it on their knees as penitents. But then it becomes this kind of geometric um, garden project, I guess, in the spirit of the, the ancient mythology of the labyrinth. Um, right, but help me. Who's the, who's the guy who builds the labyrinth? I'm blanking on my Greek. Hmm? Yeah, with the Minotaur. But so, so the garden is both a good thing and a terrifying thing for him, and he dreams of it over and over again. You want to mm -hmm. talk about that symbol and about those gardens and is this something that captivated you before you got to Versailles, or is this something that happened to you when you were there? Yeah, well, um, I knew about the gardens of Versailles, but I didn't know about the labyrinth. The labyrinth is no longer there, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. It was torn down, but... Um, but I knew the labyrinth was there, and it's actually, it was where Marie Antoinette's Hamlet um, is in that space now. Um, they bulldozed her. Well, they didn't have bulldozers back then, but they took it out. <laughs> I'm sure it took a lot of servants to maintain it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but uh, gosh, how many servants must have, t have taken to pull up all those trees, all those uh, shrubs? They were like 10 feet tall, the, the shrubs of the labyrinth. Right. I don't even know if they're right. called I mean, shrubs. Straight when they're out of Harry that. Potter and yeah. the Triwizard Cup. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the labyrinth struck me as a place that he might wander into as a 10, 11 year old boy. Yeah. Um, the labyrinth, the menagerie, that is also no longer there. Um, they brought in animals from all over the world. Um, they brought in the most exotic animals. They brought in giraffes, they brought in elephants, they brought in exotic birds, cheetahs. Every animal you can think of they had at the menagerie. And they um, eventually, uh, as they died off, they stopped bringing new ones in. Um, after Louis XV died, uh, Louis XVI 
I think they said the birds were the last ones left, and unfortunately, during the revolution, people were so hungry, they broke into the menagerie and took care of a lot of the birds. But they were able to, to um, they were able to take a lot of the animals out and move them to Paris. And from what I understand, that was the first zoo, uh, the animals from Versailles. So um, he was fascinated by those animals because the animals, the way the menagerie was built, there was a central platform that you walk up and then you look down on the animals and you can see them in their pens. And he looked at them and, he, and at first he loves looking at them, but then he thought, they're pinned in just like me. Just like me. Just like right. me, I'm pinned into this place. Um, and then there's also the fox. Um, there is, the labyrinth was fascinated because it was studded by um, uh, marble and stone statue scenes that were actual scenes of fairy tales and fables um, because... You know that that's really interesting. Yeah, the, um, one of the uh, fairy tale writers <laughs> was uh, a friend of Louis XIV. And so he gave a, a whole group of them. There, mm -hmm. there was a whole movement of fairy tale writers. A lot mm -hmm. of them were women. Oh, I didn't um, know that. Oh, yeah, that's fun. That's that. subject for another talk, wow. another novel. Wow. Some of them were spies. And, I did not know that. Yeah, they wanted revenge on their, their horrible husbands. Hey. Yeah, <laughs> we'll talk about that. Again. That's interesting. But yeah, there's, there's a courtly tradition of fairy tales that isn't children's storybooks, mm -hmm. but they're, um, they're fairy tales with a lot of kind of subtle politics in them. Yeah, subtext. and morality lessons, apparently, that he was using to teach the kids. And so they had these, um, you know, the labyrinths, and then you'd have a, a scene of an animal with a child and a fountain, and then you'd go a little further, and you'd have a different scene of a different animal and different fable. And it struck me as something that would fascinate a child. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so when he got lost in the labyrinth, he found himself sitting in uh, a storm came along. He finds himself sitting in the freezing rain um, because it's dark and the trees are so high, there's no light in there. So he's in pitch dark except when the lightning strikes. And, and I stole a little bit from Doctor Who because, you know, the, <laughs> the angels, the stone angels. <laughs> But <laughs> he finds himself in front of this fox, uh, this stone fox. And uh, the fox seems to come alive when, alive when the lightning strikes. And it's an image that comes to him throughout his life whenever he's in trouble, whenever he's scared. He goes into this kind of catatonia where he's sitting uh, in space staring at this, um, this fox's eyes and feeling trapped once again. So it's a recurring theme. I mean, foxes are so interesting because they're considered wily, but they're also a hunted animal, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? That you. Um, I love foxes. Of, well, <laughs> who, who loves a fox? <laughs> Fascinating. We have some living here in Bexley, right? Oh. Yeah, we do. Um, I wondered another another symbol that I thought was really powerful that you chose was the Levant. Right? So yeah. one of the ways that a certain kind of French bread was made is sourdough, right? Who likes sourdough? Yeah. So that was kind of a bit of material culture. So there's Salenav, who is kind of a, a kitchen servant who um, befriends him more and kind of takes care of him a little bit. Um, and she shows him the, the levain, right? Mm -hmm. And, and so this is something that makes beautiful, tasty bread is very ugly and has to go through a whole process of transformation over and over again. And she has this 75-year-old sourdough starter that's <laughs> then in her family that's kind of this heirloom, chemical heirloom. I want to talk about why you chose that because I think it's a brilliant um, symbol of uh, of the kind of polyvalence of beauty and taste and, and ugliness that, that are in constant tension in, in this world that you're visiting in the novel. Mm -hmm. So I'm an um, amateur bread maker. I love, I, you know, I have my sourdough at home. <laughs> I have my own starter at home. 
And, so you observe um, it on a daily basis. Uh, I should. I put it in the refrigerator because I don't have the energy and the time to keep up the way I should. But it always. I guess Selenov tells him to go put it by the window so it will calm down <laughs> and get cold. <laughs> exactly. And then bring it over the fire so that it will activate. Uh huh. And exactly, because it's full of this bacteria that is, um, it changes according to the environment it's in. And sometimes when the Soft bacteria doesn't, you know, isn't cutting it. The hard bacteria comes out and does what it needs to do to develop the gluten and the and the yeast and for um, for the starter to bubble up and grow, gives it its flavor and gives it its strength. And it just occurred to me that um, when he's at the palace of Versailles, everybody feels so much stronger than he is. His his feelings are hurt constantly because you're abusing him at the palace, and he doesn't know how to cope with it. And so she explains to him that, you know, um, she explains to him what the starter's doing. He kind of turns it into his own moral <laughs> story of what he right. should be doing. And he realizes if he can kind of feed off the misery of others, that maybe he'll grow strong like they are. And that's what he does. Right. It's, it's kind of a life-changing moment. And so he decides to become, you know, to work on killing off <laughs> the king and, and the court um, mm -hmm. and, you know, to become uh, like secretly bad but look okay on the surface. Yeah. And you, you talk about kind of a black, oilish substance that's, that appears on the sourdough um, as part of this. So that there's a color changing aspect to the sourdough as well. Yeah, so I, I don't know if anybody else has a starter at home, but if you, um, <laughs> sometimes when you, um, when it sits too long and it doesn't have enough food to eat, it will put off this, technically what it is, it's kind of like bile. It puts off this layer of bile on top of itself. It's, it's almost like um, you know, the human stomach. When you're really, really hungry, and your stomach starts rumbling, you have this bile going on down there because you're hungry. Same thing happens with the starter. It looks disgusting, but it's, it's, it's okay. <laughs> you can pour it off if you need to, if anybody is interested in that. Right, it can recover, um. <laughs> and that's one of the lessons, too. Yeah. Like, like mm -hmm. um, that it's adaptable, and it can live for 75 yeah, years. Yeah, it's not dead. It looks dead. Right. He gets very upset because he thinks the starter is dead. And she has to show him that it just looks dead. It's not. It's, it's alive. It might be on its last legs, but it's still alive. And so long as it's alive, you can feed it and bring it back. And so, um, yeah, it's just one of those symbols that just kind of worked out uh, well for the story. So it was fun putting it in there. Yeah, I, I liked it a lot. <laughs> and I think it's kind of apropos as we're thinking about color and you know, race and survival mm. and I thought it was a nice metaphor. Well, um, do we need to turn it over to questions, Zach? Yeah, maybe. Okay, we can do that, or I can keep. I, I have a quick question to open it up. Um, you use this uh, method of, or this device of kind of like a diary entry from Zamor to really put us into his, um, his personal thoughts. Um, I was just curious if you came across any correspondence through your research from, from his writings or how you came to use that device um, to really like explore his, how he was interpreting um, his life? I wish I, I wish I had some um, correspondence from him. Um, no, I know uh, the journal entries, it's, it's actually in historical fiction, it's not an uncommon thing for people to use that. I am um, one who until I started writing these books, I hadn't written a first-person point of view. When I decided to write this in first person, I thought it would be great to start the story from his, his, um, his own words to try to bring him to life a little bit, because so little was known about him. I wanted to get the reader immediately into his headspace and immediately introduced to him and his thought process throughout the story of what's happening to him. There's, there's a nice level of historical accuracy there because the roman epistolaire, the, the epistolary novel, 
was one of the most important French genres in this period, um, and, and it was influential in, in other language cultures. Um, and, and some of those are set in colonies or in other spaces. And you know, with that removal, that kind of fictional removal, it allows the author to reflect on the problems in French society. Um, so you're, you, know, you're, you take a place in a long line of writers, mm -hmm. right, from um, Claudel de Laclos with the Les Liaisons, the Dangerous Liaisons you maybe know, um, Voltaire is one, Montesquieu, the Persian letters. Um, who's, who's the woman? Madame de, I don't know, she writes one about a woman um, telling her own story in letters to her faraway lover, but in the not, the not transmission culture in South America. Mm -hmm. I don't know what I'm talking about. Madame de Graffini, more books to read. Put it on your list. <laughs> Um, but yeah, there were women writing these too. Yeah. Which is sometimes yeah. something that gets forgotten. Yeah. All the male authors that are treated as the most important. So. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, people wrote a lot of letters in this period. Yeah. Well, it's in Zach's hand. Zach's going to bring you the microphone. Oh, yes. Uh, I, I have two questions, uh, uh, and one, we, we might not know it, but I, I was reading, he, he was born in Chittagong, in, in what's now Bangladesh. Do, do we know if he would have spoken Bengali or been immersed in any? Yeah, that I don't know. Yeah, um, and, and, and he, he may have been assimilated out of it, too, I was having been in, yeah. Sorry, yeah, he probably, he probably did. I, you know, I was torn, I, uh, because there is so little known about him, I had no evidence of of, of his life in India. Um, I wish I did. Um, one of the interesting things, there's been a controversy uh, in the past couple of years from historians who, some historians who say that he wasn't actually black. Um, there are about three portraits of him um, that for a long time were thought to be Zamor. Mm -hmm. They're now captioned as previously thought to be Zamor. Um, <laughs> they're saying that it could be that, as I mentioned earlier, that because these portraits are of a black man, a black servant, that they might have just been called some more. There is one portrait of, um, actually not a portrait, a drawing of uh, a child who um, looks like an Indian, an Indian child with light skin. Um, and so now they're saying that that is actually truly Zamora. But what I did find out was there were uh, communities of black people in India. I did not know that until I started researching. There are several, several different communities. And there was a community in Chittagong um, around the time of his birth of people in a black community. All of the black communities have since, um, unlike here in the United States where we, um, uh, we're in the cities, um, in India, the black communities, they kind of moved away from the cities. They, they moved far into the forest. I, I feel oh, like into the forest. Into the forest, and I feel like that has something to do with the slave trade, <laughs> and um, and seeing what was happening and um, people starting to pick off their children. But I wish I knew more about his life in uh, Bengal. Thank you. And just my other question was, um, you said you've written three other novels. Um, how uh, how does this compare with the other work you've done, and how was the writing process different? Interestingly enough, um, prior to this, I had written, uh, years ago, I wrote a suspense novel. Then I wrote uh, two romance novels. <laughs> and then I stopped writing for a, a while. Um, in anticipation of this book, after I did the first draft, I decided to write uh, two novellas. Well, I decided to write the first novella, and then I got feedback that forced me to write another novella um, based on a character that's going to show up in Zamora's life. So, those two novellas are both historical fiction, and the character, the uh, main character of those are gonna be um, someone who shows up. It's kind of like an overlap, this book right here. Thank you for your question. We had a question online. Um, someone says, uh, this book sounds so interesting. Um, what part of his life uh, Folk, did you focus on in the first book, and then for the upcoming books, is it direct continuation, or do you kind of parse them out um, at different stages of uh, Zamor's life? 
great question. Um, yes, so the first book covers from the time that he comes to the palace of Versailles at about 10, and uh, it goes up to the start of the French Revolution, 1789. So um, the prologue to the first book is actually um, a snapshot to what happens that we all know about the, the moment when uh, Madame du Barry is arrested. But then it goes back in time to when he first arrives in the Palace of Versailles. Book two is from um, 1793 until uh, 17, oh no, 1789 to 1793. And the last book is from 1793 to the end of his life. So the intense years of the revolution up to the terror, and then through those, you're going to imagine through those years where you don't really know what happened to them, to him? I'm writing a story. Yeah. <laughs> no, so it gives you room in volume three to, um, there, to imagine the trajectory for yeah, him. Yeah, there's, yeah, all bets are off in that one. <laughs> but um, book two is a lot to do with the um, revolution and that whole time period. I was just wondering um, what books you've used to gather your research because, I mean, a lot of what you're um, describing I've never heard of, like um, having to justify the slave trade and like creating these images. I've never like heard of that history of France, so I mean, I'm interested in like looking more into it and doing my own like reading. Yeah, what's your bibliography, Patty? So what I'm going to do uh, for book two and book three, I think I'm going to put a list of all of the references that I use. I did a lot of online, uh, just looking at online babble. You know, there's a lot of stuff online. You can find all sorts of things. I looked at everything, and I probably looked at too much stuff because, you know, a lot of it is just bunk. But some of it are my story. So, <laughs> so I'm going to put it in my, um, in my book two and book three. Um, I was able to find some journals and articles written by um, uh, uh, faculty and um, uh, professors that really helped a lot when it came to understanding his image after he died and what was done to his image and, um, and how he was treated and how he was looked at and how he was demonized, really. Um, even though we know not a whole lot about him, he showed up a lot throughout history, and it, was, it seemed a, a concentrated effort to consistently demonize him whenever he did pop up. And that, ha, you know, that hasn't really, you know, it's been, I found a, a coffee ad um, from Washington, D.C. in the, um, I want to say it was the 1800s, maybe. No, no, it was the 1900s. Coffee ad where they referenced him, and I thought, here in the United States, <laughs> and it just went to, to show that after the revolution, a lot of people escaped uh, or left France and came to the United States and continued the uh, negative narrative about him. So. The legend of Zamor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Was, was that good, Ogishi, or? One, one more came through. Uh, they one were curious about like writing historical fiction. How much do you uh, kind of let the story drive it, and how much do you uh, try to rely on the historical narrative? Because um, it's a delicate balance. Yeah. Um, in the beginning, I had a real hard time because I was trying to stick to historical fact a little bit too much. I was trying to make sure everything fit. Um, I ended up having to lighten up on myself a bit because it still needs to be an interesting story to read. And there are professionals who, professional historians <laughs> who can do that better than I can. Um, but I did want to have a framework and I did want to make sure the historical facts that I did include were at least um, that they were recognizable and that they were um, plausible and the situations that I put him in were plausible as well. So um, I stepped away from having to go hardcore his history to create the story. Just one definition of a good novel is one um, 
one in which you want to linger in the presence of the author's mind you know? mm -hmm. um, and, and that world that you create. I think that's true for lots of us who like fiction. So I say, yeah, let's be creative. And <laughs> there's a long tradition of that. So. Yeah. yeah. But I think one of the things I hear you saying is fear of anachronism, the fear of getting some of the historical details wrong or maybe imposing bias on the past. Do you ever worry about that? Um, I do worry about getting things wrong, definitely. I know there are people who are going to tell me and let me know when I get it wrong. <laughs> um, um, I already have people who let me know when I get my French wrong. I try my best. <laughs> you can only do what you can do. Um, but at some point, the story itself, I'm satisfied with the story itself. Um, it, it came, I wanted to present him as a full human being. Mm -hmm. I wanted to um, break that tendency of people to discount him as just the traitor. And I want to um, present him so that he's not just a footnote to Jean de Berry that he was a full person with his own life and his own hopes and his own dreams. And he managed somehow, even though he was surrounded by all of these titans who all didn't, didn't make it through, <laughs> he managed to make it through. And you don't, that doesn't happen by accident. He had to be an incredibly intelligent man mm -hmm. and he had to be a survivor. And I think he needs to be recognized for that. One of the things you do is you make him um, a good student of language. Um, you have a tutor, you know, you, you kind of build up this world in which his tutor says, oh, he's learning everything so fast, I almost can't teach him anything. Mm -hmm. um, you use kind of chapter two, you show him learning the, the French language very quickly, but you use it as exposition to help your, your English language lead, reader, yeah, I see you nodding, kind of figure out what's going on. So every mm -hmm. author's got to have an an exposition uh, mm -hmm. set up. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think, I'm just curious if, like, you, you, in setting him, it sounds like you're setting him right, in a way, in your mind. So, mm -hmm. um, like, a, a happy bias, would you say? <laughs> like, where do you feel like you know, where do you know you're biased? And how do you feel about that? Well, I, I know like I'm not, I'm yeah. I'm just saying I, that because every writer is biased, right? We're just taking that as the ground rule there. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm biased for him towards, yeah, yeah definitely. Um, I, I remember reading a, a review of, there was a film that came out last year, uh, Jean de Berry by Maiwen over in France oh, that yeah, hasn't been released uh, yet Johnny in the United Depp States. Is the yeah. drunken Louis Vuitton. <laughs> And I read a review about it, and what they said was that the movie might have been an effort to, um, to uh, set her story right, basically. And I thought, well, who's setting his story right? Wait a minute. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know about this. I, I feel yeah. like he, didn't never, he never had a voice. Um, I imagine, because he, of what I know about his intelligence, I imagine he was writing. And that's why I... Um, that's why I feel he was a writer. I might be wrong, <laughs> but he was a, a, a lover of words. And I feel, you know, it is my dream that one day somebody in France is going to uncover a box of his works or going to uncover a box of evidence or research or notes about him the way they have about uh, the Chevalier. Yeah, the Chevalier Saint-Georges. Uh -huh. I wondered if you were interested. Mm -hmm. you, want to, you want to talk about the Chevalier Saint-Georges because this is another kind of famous, courtly, very gifted black figure who's maybe a little bit less forgotten to time because he did write, right? He wrote music well, and... Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. I don't well, he, no, that's okay. He was lost to time. Um, and he was, you know, I... I he was disappeared. He's, right. <laughs> he was he disappeared. Was forgotten and kind of erased. We could yeah, say. And, yeah, and some would think intentionally because he um, probably pissed off some people that he didn't need. To, well, that, you know. Um, he was disappeared. And, <laughs> and in the past couple of years, people have discovered him and they did a movie about him as well. And he will make an appearance in book two. Okay. Oh, I'll just say. Stay I'll just tuned. Say. <laughs> 
Um, all right, well, I think we're at eight o'clock, yeah. aren't we? Is, uh, is there a publication date for book two yet? Um, it's coming out this summer. I'm hoping to get it out June. Yeah. Well, Sarah Grace, Patty, <laughs> thank you so much for tonight's discussion. This was wonderful, and uh, there will be a recording on uh, the BPL YouTube channel to uh, review this fascinating discussion. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and if I may, we meet um, on Sundays at 3 o'clock to read aloud and discuss.